Welcome back to part three of this introductory series. I'm Raj Kletke. Today we'll finish up by looking at mayflies and then very briefly at stoneflies. Mayfly adults are the upright winged insects that you sometimes see floating on the water like little sailboats. Mayflies are closely associated with the history of fly fishing and are to many fly fishermen, including me, their favorite insect. There are multiple families and numerous genera and species of mayflies and not all of them can be fished alike. For fly fishermen, mayflies are usually grouped into four different nymph types. Note that mayflies have nymphs, not larvae like the midges and caddis we've seen in the previous parts of this series. This means the nymphs already have all the major body parts and hence only have to go partial change to the adult stage. This partial change is called incomplete metamorphosis. We'll mention nymph types a little more later when it becomes important. Mayflies emerge from their nymphs as duns, which no longer are capable of eating or drinking, so are short-lived. They molt quickly. For some species, it's less than two hours, but for most species, it's within 24 to 48 hours. They'll molt, molt to the sexually mature form known as a spinner. Spinners can usually be identified by clear, transparent wings. After mating, the spinners lay eggs and die. The spent spinner is usually what we think of when we hear the term spinner. But it gets a little more complicated than that. Emergences progress in stages from the nymph to ultimately the dun. These intermediate stages are known as emergers and are often very vulnerable to trout. I consider the floating nymph an early stage emerger and the dun with the still attached nymphal skin, which we often call a shuck, a late stage emerger. Emergence is, however, a continuum, so there are many stages in between, some of which might need representation during an actual emergence. In addition, some emerging mayflies don't make it and are known as cripples and stillborns. These are also especially vulnerable to the trout. So there are, at least theoretically, numerous patterns that may be useful for mayfly hatches. So let's try to simplify this a little. Let's start with the pre-emergence hatch. This is a time when the nymphs become active before emerging. For some mayflies, you might consider this as starting several days before the emergence as the nymphs migrate to slower water. More commonly though, we think of the pre-emergence hatch as only the couple of hours prior to the emergence as the nymphs become very active, rising towards the surface. This is a time when you should be searching with a mayfly nymph that imitates the mayfly species expected rather than a caddis or sow bug pattern. A pheasant tail nymph in the proper size is commonly used for many mayflies and is one of my favorite flies, but there are many other choices also. Different mayflies have different emergence patterns which require being fished in different fashions. These are the patterns I try to think of when trying to classify and simplify common emergence types. Let's start with the mayfly nymphs that crawl out of the stream to emerge. These listed are relatively common, fairly large mayflies. You'll see them flying around and get all excited. But again, these nymphs leave the stream, so you won't be fishing a true emergence. You might be able to fish the pre-emergence as these nymphs migrate towards shore for several days prior to emergence. These are swimmer nymphs, which can dart like minnows, so theoretically you can try swinging your nymph near the bottom of the stream towards shore with movement, almost like a small streamer. You may also fish a spinner fall of these mayflies. Unfortunately, I've not had the opportunity to fish these mayflies, so I have no direct experience. Many of the common mayflies we fish have the classical emergence. I'll use blue-winged olives as the example as they are a very common group of mayflies that emerge over months during much of the fishing season and are a favorite emergence of mine. If you trout fish more than just a little, you will be on the water during, during a blue-winged olive emergence. Sometimes it may be a super hatch, which you can't miss, but occasionally it may be quite sporadic and a minimal hatch, which is easy to miss if you're not specifically looking for it. 
One reason blue wing olives are so common and emerge over many months is that the blue wing olive is the common name for actually a large group of different mayflies, different genera, different species, and even different families. Some of these mayflies have multiple broods a year. Betus is the most common genus, so you'll likely hear this term also, but sometimes it's used loosely and incorrectly. The large group of blue-winged olives include mayflies that range from hook sizes, basically 16 to 24, and some have variation in color. Luckily, most in this group can be fished in a similar fashion just by using the correct size flies. Mm -hmm. Most common blue-winged olive mayflies are quite small and emerge in relatively flat water. I'll commonly use a simple wrap for my done or late stage emerger, a floating pheasant tail nymph, the WD-40, or a loop wing emerger as a dropper off the done for early to mid-stage emergers, and a soft hackle for a stillborn or cripple. I have had to use my parachute pattern several times when the simple wrap didn't work, and I've had times, especially during a super hatch, when many naturals are also being ignored by the trout, when I couldn't catch a, any of the numerous rising fish on my common flies. You may not be familiar with a simple wrap, which is one of my favorite small done patterns. As the name implies, I just put on a tail or shuck. The thread is the body, and I wrap a hackle over the front half of the hook. I usually put a small underlying thorax of dubbing before wrapping the hackle, but many don't. For blue wing olives, I'll cut off the bottom fibers as I'll be fishing these on flat water and want a low profile. You could leave the hackles intact and then trim them streamside if needed or wanted. While those are the patterns I usually use for a blue wing olive emergence, you should use what you have confidence in. You fish flies you have confidence in better and generally will catch more fish. Let's move on to the subsurface emergers many of which are clinger nymphs, sometimes referred to as fast water nymphs. Some of these common names include several different genera of variable sizes. I've mainly fished the eastern and midwestern March Browns and the western Pale Evening Dunn complex in Montana. With this emergence type, the dun sheds the nymph shuck below the surface and then continues to the surface as a bedraggled dun for some, this occurs near the bottom of the stream, but for most, it occurs just several inches below the surface. When the dun reaches the surface, it may sit on the surface for a while to dry or may quickly fly away. During this emergence type, the soft hackle fished subsurface, swinging it towards slower water several inches below or in the surface usually works better for me. If I see duns on the surface and fish taking them, I'll certainly tie on a dun, but commonly will use a soft hackle as a dropper. I carry and use a lot of soft hackles, which I feel are underused by many fishermen. Many mayflies emerge midstream, but some species typically emerge in shallow waters near the shores. These edgewater emergers include mayflies that have both the classical emergence pattern and mayflies that have the subsurface emergence pattern. I've seen this type of emergence mainly on large rivers out west. Nymphs from these species of mayflies typically migrate to slow, shallow water, sometimes within inches or a foot or more next to shore. The location of the emergence is obvious because you see the rising fish and often see the fish themselves in this shallow water. Staying calm is one of the problems. You may take, the fish may take dun patterns, but this slow edge water lends itself to cripples and stillborns, especially with the smaller mayflies, which have difficulty breaking through the surface tension. I often use a quiggly cripple for the western mahogany duns, which otherwise are a classical emerger, but they merge in shallow water, and a soft hackle for the western pale evening duns, which are a subsurface emerger, but commonly near shore. For my mayflies in general, I also tie and use sparkle duns and quads, which are really late stage emergers, but seem to work well for duns also. 
I do tie thorax pattern in size 14 and 16, mainly for fast water, which is why I over hackle it. Many fishermen carry multiple different colors. I usually carry some of these patterns in light and dark colors, but generally I don't find color near as important as size. So if you're tying these up, tie up different sizes first. You will definitely need for the blue wing olive patterns and stages, sizes hook 18 to 22. So tie these first and then add other patterns and sizes depending on the hatches you'll see. So now we've covered most of the common mayfly emergence patterns and flies that I use. Unfortunately, you may need to experiment a lot when fishing with them. The right fly is usually not as obvious as it is when caddis fishing. I'll fish a pattern quite a while before changing. If I'm getting refusals, I'll first check the fly size, the tippet, especially the tippet length, and the stage of the organism, especially if I'm sure that I am fishing the correct hatch. Well, now let's expand our list of flies needed to cover the spinner fall. Mayfly spinners, as we said before, are the egg layers, the sexually mature form. Some spinners, after laying their eggs, fly back to the bushes and become worthless for fishing. But many ultimately die as spent spinners on the surface of the streams and rivers, and trout will take them quite readily. These are the spinners of the spinner falls that we talk about and like to fish. Many mayflies have a fishable spinner fall, but it is often variable in timing and location, so it's hard to predict. My favorite spinner fall is the trico spinner fall, which is very predictable and common. So I'll use trichos as my example. Trichos are some of the smallest mayflies you'll see, but they emerge from July through September in many places, often giving two to three months of great, but sometimes frustrating, fishing. Out west, I've seen clouds of trichos like those pictured here. They'll fall in matted masses on the water and will have numerous rising and rhythmically feeding large trout taking them. But sparser spinner falls may be easier to fish as you're not competing with so many naturals. The male trichos emerge at night. The females emerge in the morning and the female trico emergence is also very fishable with small duns. But the spinner fall, which usually is a little over an hour or two later, is the real highlight of the day for many of us fishermen. If you haven't fished with trichos, you're missing a great deal of fun. Let's digress briefly to look at trico spinner patterns and fly design a little bit closer. The trico has one of the thickest thoraces for its size of any mayflies. mayfly. The thorax indents the surface notably and I feel is important. My traditional trico spinner is the classical poly wing tied in reverse with a wide two millimeter thorax. This has worked very well on lesser fish waters. Out west it also works, but there are trico spinner, but there the trico spinner fall is fished heavily every day by numerous fishermen often using this or a very similar pattern. The fish can become very choosy and I believe pattern shy. So I've experimented with multiple different ties. I've used different winging materials and styles. I've caught trout on all of these patterns, but also have been frustrated with all of these patterns, so I keep experimenting. Size seems to matter, but the wing length hasn't really seemed to matter much. A little flash in the wing has seemed to help. I still have to cut the crystal flash to length here, but you can see the crystal flash better in this picture. I've even looped the crystal flash to give a wider wing, but this didn't seem to work any better than a single strand or two of crystal flash, and tying with a single strand or two was much easier. Many times I've quit fishing to closely examine numerous trico spinners on the water. I've been surprised how much they varied in size, even on the same day. Out west this past year, sizes 18 to 24 were on the water at the same time, but most were size 22, and a size 22 did seem to work best. The tail surprising wasn't a significant feature in indenting the water, and I've left the tail off now for many years. I do seem to get better hookups this way. I've also been surprised that the spinners that I picked up weren't completely dead. Their legs were still moving. 
Since I believe that micro movement may be an important trigger, I now tie my thoraces on trico spinners with spiky dubbing, leaving it rough on the bottom and cutting it smooth on the top. I don't know yet whether this really makes a difference, but it hasn't seemed to hurt, and it has become my standard tie. Experimentation and finding more effective patterns is one of the joys of tying your own flies. So let's continue on with fishing a trico spinner fall. Trico spinners are small and fished in the surface, making them difficult to see. Often you have to get the fly in the correct feeding lane on the correct timing, sometimes taking 30 or more casts per strike. I usually use a size 18 Alcare Caddis as an indicator fly so I can find my spinner. A couple of years ago out west, I caught my three largest trout during a trico spinner fall. One trout was over 20 inches on the indicator fly. So much for selective feeding. Anyway, I do better near shore in relatively quiet pockets than in mid-river, and this is often where the larger fish go. I cast down and across a little upstream of the rising fish, often with a reach cast, and then pull the streamer even further up into the feeding lane before allowing the fly to dead drift to the fish. If the fly isn't taken, I let it swing off to the side and cast again. Sometimes the trout is ryth rhythmically gulping clusters of trico spinners, and the aim is to get your fly into that cluster. Being in the correct lane with the correct timing may be in more, more important than the pattern sometimes. Incidentally, many fishermen recommend targeting an individual fish, but I sometimes seem to do better casting to a group of fish feeding closely together. I think that the competition by the fish may make a difference, especially during a sparse spinner fall. Also, if I'm not getting any luck with surface spinners, I will try sinking my spinner, and sometimes this works well. For a more general discussion of mayflies and tying some of the flies I use, see my Simple Entomology series, parts 11 and 12. Let's move on to stoneflies. I don't, stone, I don't find stoneflies very important for me except as searching nymphs. Adult stoneflies have down wings folded flat over their back. There are, there are numerous genera, but basically you can think of stoneflies as belonging to two groups, a large-sized group and a smaller-sized group. The nymphs are commonly found on rocks in fast water, well-oxygenated water. You may confuse the smaller stonefly nymphs with larger mayfly nymphs, but remember the rule of twos for a stonefly nymph. Two tails, a couple of mayfly nymphs do have two tails, but most have three, Two nearly prominent wing cases, note the prothorax shell also is not a wing case, and two toes. Also, stoneflies don't have abdominal gills like mayflies, although the gills are sometimes difficult to see. Most stoneflies emerge out of the water, often at night, and you've probably seen their cases on shoreside rocks. Stoneflies are clumsy flyers, and some get blown back into the water shortly after emergence or when they return to lay their eggs. So you may get to fish adults or migrating nymphs during the pre-emergence or emergence of stoneflies. At least that's what the literature says, and I bet it would be fun fishing such large flies. But the large size stonefly emergences usually occur over a fairly brief period of time on a relatively short section of a river at a time, and that's hard to predict. Unfortunately, I've had no experience fishing a stonefly emergence. But I do use stonefly nymphs for searching, and in the proper water type are sometimes an excellent choice. Some species of stoneflies grow over one to two years, so are available to trout all season. The large stoneflies may grow to even size four and six before emergence. But remember that stonefly nymphs almost double in size shortly before emergence. So, before the annual emergence of a species, you can fish a large stonefly for that species. But after the annual emergence, the stonefly nymph should be significantly smaller, so decrease your hook size. Check the stonefly nymphs you find on the rocks to give you the reference as to what size to use. I commonly use an imitative, fanciful, or general attractors. 
right now the size 10 red fox squirrel tail nymph is one of my favorites. Whether the trout thinks it's a stonefly, a mayfly, a caddis larva, or just something good to eat, I really don't know, but it does work quite well for me. I do discuss stoneflies in a little more depth in my series on Simple Entomology, Part 10. Well, that's a quick overview of entomology for the fly fisherman. I hope you will find this helpful in your fishing and really hope this will inspire some of you to explore entomology further, which was really the intent of this series. It is fascinating in and of itself. I'm still learning more each year and there's a lot more to learn. There are many excellent professional resources available. My YouTube channel is rather amateurish, but it does cover my knowledge of the subject in more depth than we've had time for in this series and I show you how I tie some of the flies I've mentioned. So thanks for listening. I'm Raj Kletke, and hopefully I'll see you next year after the pandemic is over and after another good trout season. Stay safe, everyone.